Honored Confederates, fellow citizens of every canton, of every walk of life, due to a handful of zealots, a law that was passed last year in Geneva against absence. Oh. A law every true Swiss citizen should be ashamed of. Now these damn Bible thumpers feel that they can force through a similar law in the whole of Switzerland. No, no. What would our old freedom fighters like Tell and Winkle read? Like the heroes of Morgarten, Simpa, no. Lauten, Merton, and so forth actually would have said if we told them they can only drink milk and herbal tea. <laughs> but it will come to that, dear people, Never. if you allow yourselves to be shackled and allow them to ban absinthe from our beloved old Switzerland. Never. Not only do they want to deny you your schnapps, but your wine and your beer as well. These hypocrites say it isn't true. But we found it printed in black and white from a report from old Gott Templar, page 28. There, Dr. Hanko from Lausanne states unambiguously the banning of absinthe will only have a mild effect on alcoholism in general. What we are striving for is to abolish all alcohol, including wine and beer. Ooh. It is a beginning. Oh. Yes, you snakes. You want to achieve your goal so quickly. We want to ban you. Oh. Ban you from achieving it right from the beginning. What would you say if we wanted you to ban your tea and prayers? <laughs> Worry about yourselves and leave the rest of us in peace and all will be well. Until now, it has only gone badly when you have showed up. It has only gone badly when you have meddled. And yet, there is another important thing. The great murders Rafiak, Vesario, did they even once have a glass of absinthe? No! No, never, you pious hypocrites. For a long time, Absence hasn't wrought nearly as much unhappiness and misfortune for families and the world as the poisonous ideas 
You have already spread everywhere where we didn't expect and didn't want. On the contrary, everywhere you've been and taken charge, people want to get rid of you and wish you'd go to hell. Oh! Yes. Go to the devil with your tea. There, at least, stay warm. <laughs> We use cold water with our absence. Just as the Lord God gave it to us. So, all you Swiss citizens, stand up as one man and vote on Sunday with a firm no. No! If you want to be sure in later years of our absence and also want to be able to drink a flask of wine or a fresh stein of beer and whoever doesn't like that then go find another country. Yay! And see if he gets anywhere with tea and sugar water. <laughs> we, however, will vote no. Yay! And once again, no. Yay! Not only for absence, but for our freedom. And because we are men, who know how to conduct themselves. Because of a couple of drums, they want to punish all of us. We want to be left to live, to live life the way we see it. In closing, we drink a mic drop. Whether it is absent, vermouth, wine, or beer. A drink. A drink. A drink. A drink. A drink. To the well being of everyone and to our dear freedom. Thank you. In 1915, the temperance movement helped ban the production and selling of absinthe almost throughout the world. In the late 1800s, alcoholism was so widespread throughout the world, the government in association with the temperance movement had to do something to gain back control. Reverend John Edgar 
wanted more of a moral reform rather than legal measures against alcohol. Beside alcohol and a concentration on hard spirits, beer and wine were left untouched. During the Victorian period, the temperance movement became more radical, advocating the legal prohibition of all alcohol. Rather than calling for moderation, it also was perceived to be tied in with both religious renewal and progressive politics, started by the temperance movement and the winemakers. The temperance movement held under the belief that absinthe would turn you into a criminal and make you crazy. Thujan, a chemical compound inside absinthe, although present in only trace amounts, was blamed for its harmful hallucinogenic effects. You looking for me? We're all looking for you. <laughs> gotcha. Once upon a time, there was a man named Henry Louis Pernod. He was responsible and credited in 1797 with the opening of the very first absinthe distillery in Cuvée, Switzerland with his father-in-law. But our story starts much earlier than that. Claude Alain Bunion, absinthe producer, absinthe distiller. Uh, we are now in Cuvée, and I produce absinthe from the beginning of the of the legalization. And I was also a moonshiner producer of absinthe. My name is Jack Kesslin. I'm 61. I was previously a police officer, police detective for 28 years. I left 10 years ago, and now I'm working here. The absent here in this region, it's uh, more than a way of life. Here is a story of the people in, uh, in this small valley, Val de Travers, well known, first of all, for uh, watches and, of course, absinthe and green fairy. The life was nice, but uh, in, the, in the really extreme part of Switzerland, which is the poorest region of, uh, at that time, was the poorest region. And, uh, it's also maybe uh, uh, the reason why absinthe grows up here. They already spoke of Cuvée, known as the city of absinthe. We are living in the place, the birthplace of the absinthe. This region of Switzerland, it's uh, particular because uh, we never stop the production of the absinthe. That means you you are the same as when you you go in the soup. You are you are here and in in. You want to try to make absinthe. 1730, it was the biggest village in, in the valley, 1,000 uh, inhabitants. The life was uh, really poor. People were, were mainly farmers. Some of them were businessmen already. They make business with, first of all, France and Italy. But some of them were businessmen, and they traveled abroad, also to, to, to the US. First of all, to France, to Italy, and to UK. And they made a business with uh, uh, already watches. We know that absinthe started in 1730. It was not a big production. It, Artemisia, the, the Latinish name of wormwood, absinthe, wormwood. It's Artemisia absinthium. This herb was, was well known for the stomacho problem, well known for the medicinal parts. Discovered the absinthe as a, like we drink today, distilled. 
Probably it was by coincidence. And uh, finally, they start mixing with other ingredients. They start um, making an alcohol with anise funnel alcohol and this famous wormwood. It was really horrible to drink. And they tried to mix this wormwood with other ingredients. And they, they made wine with wormwood, but it's, it was not good too. It was too bitter. And they, they start by using anise fennel and mix with alcohol. And it's the beginning, real, real beginning of the absinthe drink, absinthe alcoholic beverage. It's a mix of other herbs, ingredients with wormwood to have something good to drink and good for your illness. I was astonished to see one and a half century ago that there were people already millionaire in Swiss francs out of absinthe. Pierre Ordinaire was a French medical doctor who had fled from France during the French Revolution. He settled in Cuvée, Switzerland. The medicinal use of wormwood was well known at this point. Dr. Pierre Ordinaire never invented the drink absinthe. It's more likely he never came up with the recipe, which eventually became La Fée Verte. Shortly after the French Revolution, Pierre Ordinaire traveled around Valde Treve on his faithful horse rocket. He sold absinthe initially as an all purpose cure all. Dr. Ordinaire's talents in apothecary and medicine created an elixir. Over time, it became widely accepted as a cocktail. People loved the taste and the effect. Some even have claimed it to be a cure for all their ailments. One of uh, the uh, uh, big legend was this, the story of Ordinaire, the uh, pseudo doctor, which uh, appeared to be not a doctor. This guy comes in, uh, in this Swiss part, Swiss region. The French doctor arrived in Cuvée in the 70s, 68. Uh, because he, he was leaving France, it was a troubled, troubled time in the France, and uh, as we saw, he, he spent five years in a French army, and normally he should stay uh, six. And he's, he leave the army, uh, French army, and normally canonier, uh, not not doctor, canonier, and live and come in Switzerland. He came here because Kube and three others village were uh, looking for a for a doctor. They had a lot of uh, health problems during the the past uh, winter, and they decided to to put money and to put money together and find uh, a doctor. And uh, Pierre Ordinaire came by October uh, 1768. We know really now we are hundred percent percent sure that uh, this uh, Ordinaire guys, which is called a doctor Ordinaire, was not a doctor. This guy uh, lived the French army and 20, 26 years old and uh, by desertion. He comes in Switzerland and never goes back in France because otherwise they put him in, in jail. Here in Kuwait is okay, Mr. Ordinaire, uh, please uh, bring us uh, a document confirming that you are a doctor. And he was not in, uh, in a position to do it. Refused to, to go or to present, uh, to present any document, or to go in front of a, a known doctor of the King of uh, Prussia in, in, uh, in Neuchâtel. For this ordinary guy, it comes a long time later. And you should also understand, when you just pass five years in your life, in, in the army, how you can be a doctor? when you come in Switzerland and 20, 26 years old, uh, after five years in army, you can't be a doctor. In the end, he received from his brother a paper from, uh, 
met in Pontarlier by a, a notar, saying that uh, uh, Pierre Ordinaire uh, spent three years in Besançon uh, studying uh, medicine, following the lessons of a very known uh, French professor in, in Besançon, okay? This paper, dated uh, 1769. What we found, Pierre Ordinaire was a soldier in the French artillery. And he deserted, to make it short. He, uh, he entered the army in uh, 1762. February, and he deserted in June 1767. He came to La Chaux-de-Fonds, uh, the big known watch city uh, in the Jura, directly from the from the army, and he stayed in La Chaux-de-Fonds from October. Uh, 1767 up to September 1768. He had no time to study medicine and to follow lessons in Besançon. He was a soldier and uh, he came here and he tried with the help of his uh, brother to uh, to make medicine, and he did it. He did it because we needed a Couvet and Fleurier and Bovès and Motier needed a doctor or at least somebody dealing with medicine. <laughs> and Pierre Ordinaire was that guy. The French uh, army and the king learned that he was here in Kobe and asked to have the uniform back. <laughs> when Pierre Ordinaire died, the recipe ended up mysteriously in the hands of the Henriot sisters around the end of the 18th century. Henriette Henriot, referred to as Mother Henriot, has always been aware of the medical benefits of wormwood. She produced an elixir made of wormwood in her hometown of Kube, Switzerland. It was used to cure various diseases. This absinthe will wait more than 100 years to, to be really a drink. In the same time, here in Kube, somebody, probably, this, uh, it's very, very hard to find really which people were involved. Miss Henriot. Mother Henriot were, were a woman. The legend says she found the extrait d'absinthe. Mother Henriot used to cultivate the herbs in her own garden. She had a small still in her kitchen. She distilled the elixir at home. She was never able to produce a lot of the elixir. Her and her sister would sell small bottles of the elixir to hawkers, who would then sell them to households. Uh, you know, we have legend. A legend, it's easier to, to, to use, uh, to create a legend, to recreate the story, but... She grew at the uh, Arreuse, which uh, the river here, uh, in the valley, the family had a, an old house, and as she was uh, 40 years old, she bought one house here in Kuwait without any help. Which doesn't marry, doesn't have children, and uh, as a, a bar, cabaret at that time, 
they had uh, trouble troubles in her in her bar. It means that people are drunk, drunk too much, and they started to fight. She made already money with uh, uh, deal, dealing with with absinthe and uh, selling it to businessmen. It appeared that absinthe was already commercially available in Cuvée around 1769. Dubier often visited the Henriot sisters' bar and used to buy and drink it. Major Dubier quickly recognized the rising demand for this elixir, so he bought the recipe. Together with his future son-in-law, Henry Louis Pernod, he opened the Dubier Father and Son Distillery in 1798. It was a small distillery measuring eight by four meters, producing absinthe from the recipe which Dubier had bought off the Henriot sisters. Dubier's daughter, Emily, was married to Henry Louis Pernod. The Dubier, as a businessman, he was very clever and he, he saw that we can make money out of upside. Everybody wants to drink it because it's, uh, it's very uh, joyful and okay, I invest some money, we make the first distillery in the village and we export it. He already had the, the connections to France, first of all, to Germany and to Italy. We started 100 meters from here, from where we are now. It was a, a new, a new thing, but uh, you imagine we don't have fruit, fruit, commodity fruit, yes, fruit. We, don't, we, have, we have just wormwood growing here. And wormwood, which is a, a, a medicinal herbs, which is not interesting for animal. And we are able to mix with other ingredients and making a, a, a business, a world business. And it was really amazing for a region like uh, Val de Travers. Even if today we only spoke of the family Dubier and his uh, associate, associate, yes, Henri-Louis Pernod. The absent start to growing slowly, popular, and Pernod make the job to, to, to sell this product around the world. It's interesting to see that this product were present for maybe more than 60 years, but not really popular, and it really becomes popular with Pernod. And uh, other, all others follow him. Is this groups make the, the locomotive, make the, the, the power for the for the business of the absent. And finally, it's the Perno story. After a few successful years, Perno decided to start his own distillery. With the first distillery in Cuvée becoming too small, Perno looked to France to open a bigger distillery. In 1805, Henry Louis opened the first Perno Phil's distillery. Since then, Bruneau is a name that will always be associated with absinthe. It's the Perno story, it's important for the absinthe. The real, real important things, it's Perno, when Perno uh, grows up with uh, another way, maybe they use another way of marketing to sell absinthe, to promote absinthe around the world, not as medicinal drink, uh, not as a, uh, He'll good for you, uh, for stomach, but good for, for your brain, maybe. A lot of questions still now concerning this uh, association be between uh, Dubier and Pernod. When I speak of Dubier and read in uh, the official documents, judges or People involved in uh, in the government in in the valley, they were uh, very uh, careful when they saw the name Dubier on on the papers in a in a dispute. Pernod 
uh, this official story said that he started to work for the family Dubier just by the end of the 18th and he started uh, in Pontarlier a few years later by uh, 1805. That's the official story. I found in uh, notarial documents here in that year he made bankruptcy. His business was in Pouvet and not in Pontarlier, as the official story says. Just at that time, the legend is very different of what I found up to now. I don't say that what I could imagine is right, but what I found, the documents I have, tell another story. When Henry Lewis opened his second distillery, increased sale of absinthe and the high import taxes led Pernod to set up a larger distillery in Pontellier, France. Pernod had two sons by marriages. The younger son, Louis, by his second wife, Emily, ran the Pernod distillery in Pontellier, France. The eldest son, Edouard, remained in Cuvée. And in 1827, he transferred the company over to his name. Edward had a son who he named Edward. By the time of the ban in 1915, Edward had merged with Pernod Fills and became the third largest distillery in France. The myth of the Green Fairy comes from rot gut absinthe. Um, you drink anything that's that's adulterated in, in rot gut like that, like gin um, or vodka, uh, that's not made properly, and you're liable to hallucinate. They, they attribute a lot of it to the painters and the artists. Well, these a lot of these people were starving artists. They didn't have a lot of money to spend, so they weren't going to necessarily buy the high-end absinthe. They were looking for something cheap to buy and they ended up most probably buying some of these absinths that were not very well made, and it did get them sick, it did make them hallucinate possibly. And that's where I think a lot of this myth comes from, but good absinth made properly, distilled properly, is no worse for you than good rum or good gin. The, the Green Fairy, we are not sure where these uh, terms appear, but uh, maybe probably it was during the period of the artist period at the turning uh, between the 90s and 20s centuries when the artists were uh, good consumers for the absent. They, they like absent because absent was cheap. They like absent for the effect. They tell, the, they tell at that time that absent was a, a creativity, and uh, maybe uh, absinthe was green, and when you, you, put, you add water in your green absinthe, you add water with your sugar cube, with spoon, and you have this milky coming appear, appearing in your, uh, in your glass. Maybe it's, uh, it's the reason why they call that green fairy. And maybe if you drink enough absinthe, uh, green absinthe, you, you will see green fairy as for other guys which uh, other uh, drugs uh, see pink, uh, pink elephant or something like that. But uh, 
it's not a term used commonly used here. We we here it was more, more a, a blanche, une blanche, or the, or, or in, uh, in blue, right? because it was clear absent. Clear, slightly blue, but green fairy probably more in Paris with artists. All recreational drugs were basically free and open to the public back at the turn of the century. You could go to out and buy opium, you could smoke hash, you could, um, you could do just about anything. You could go to an opium den and go smoke opium all evening and go drink absinthe after. And then if you were hallucinating, well why? You know, you think about it. So you had other factors in with this concept of the green fairy that it most probably wasn't just the absinthe and people that had these addictive type personalities that like to indulge in many types of stimulants most probably did see the green fairy. Be my witness, I never shall yield till we come face to face, till we come face to face. He knows his way in the dark. Mine is the way of the Lord. Those who follow the path of the righteous shall have their reward. And if they should fall as Lucifer fell, the flames will soar. By the 1860s, drinking absinthe became extremely popular in bars, bistros, cafes, and cabarets throughout France. 5 p.m. was known as Le Eau Bete, the green hour. All social classes drank absinthe, from the wealthy bourgeois to the poor working class and artists. Absinthe was easily embraced by bohemian writers and artists. My lady? Aren't you going to join us? <laughs> Just come and join us. Forget your coat. Don't spend too much time with him. Bye, Vincent. Keep doing this to yourself. I know. The 
the last thing that I want to do is hurt you. It's my love for you that hurts. It wouldn't be fair if I didn't tell you how I feel. What can I do to express my love for you? Pas moi. Pas moi. Pas moi. Pas moi. Pas moi. Paint me. If she doesn't love you. What should I do? Forget it. You show your love for us. But, but how? You figured it out. amazing to the green fairy we, we we thinks it's appear when the the artist Parisian artists start drinking absinthe they drink absinthe probably because it was a trendy at that time and also because it was cheap product and uh, really cheap and when you are artists you you are you are poor until you are in cemetery and they like absinthe and finally they 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 saw that absinthe give them some uh, brain inspiration they they it's amazing but if you are artist some people like drinking absinthe because they more more uh, more inspiration romantics realists and impressionists many of the pioneers of modern art were acquaintances of the Green Ferry. In 1863, Edward Manet exhibited his painting La Jejeune Zeheb, which sparked the birth of the modern art era. Impressionists argued they did not see objects, only the light they reflect. Edward Manet was an important artist in the transition from realism to impressionism, and he was an absinthe drinker. Vincent van Gogh, Pablo Picasso, Ernest Hemingway, and Oscar Wilde. These artists believed that absinthe was an essential ingredient for the creative process.
After drinking absinthe, Oscar Wilde described the feeling of having tulips on his legs after leaving a cafe. The great Oscar Wilde. Oscar. Robert. <laughs> Sit down. Why must you always make me wait? Truth be told, I'm always early. I like to peer at you from a distance. You get nervous. <laughs> Absinthe. Yes. Better make it two. <laughs> Aren't I beautiful? Thank you. Must have been from all your wild nights. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, how I miss the days when we were both so young. And speak for yourself. I'm still young. <laughs> you should have taken better care of yourself. To the good old days. This is poison to me. Well, then why do you drink it? I got to live for. Oh, you always were one for the dramatic. <laughs> as are you, Robert, as are you. <clears throat> so what do the doctors say is wrong with you? Muscle poison. Syphilis. No. It is not, because it does not itch. The doctor from the embassy visits me regularly. Well, what is his diagnosis? How to operate on my ear. Well, that would explain the bandage on your ear. I never know with you. I've been in such pain since I've been that person. Well, you're mad doing this. You should be resting. I can't afford to die. you can afford to drink. Yes. Robert? Is that you, Robert? No, it's not Robert. Why must you always 
Please make me wait. Robert? You may be sin herself. My dear. The wall. You have some grand ideas. <laughs> this wallpaper and I are going to have a fight. Two, three, finish. One of us. Absinthe has been around for quite a long time in Europe, as you know. Um, Henri Louis Pernod started commercially producing it in 1805. And in 1827, the story goes, according to Marie Claude Delahaye, who's an official um, that has a museum in Abbeswar, Paris, outside of Paris, 
1827, Henri Louis donated the Cuvée distillery, which was the original distillery in Cuvée, to his son, Edouard. And they had an agreement that the father would sell to the French and the colonies, and the son would sell to the rest of the market and the Swiss. That agreement stayed in place until Edward's son broke it. But prior to that, at about 1834, 1835, you start seeing absinthe imported here in New Orleans. There are numerous ads in the newspaper of cases of Swiss absinthe coming into the city of New Orleans. So it was here in the early 1830s. And you had, you had your gin and you had your whiskey and you had all of that still coming here also. But absinthe had a, a particular flavor here, especially with our French heritage. It was basically a French Creole society here. Uh, about 1837, there was a large panic, and a lot of people lost their businesses, and it was like a, a recession, a depression. It lasted for quite a while, almost a year, um, before things picked up. So you had a little dip. You had dips. You did have so, not real depressions, but um, panics, as they called them. Uh, and with the changeover of you know governments going on right when the Louisiana Purchase you know and there were business opportunities all around also um, and it got even better as cotton became more more prominent as, as one of the factors here and the shipping was picking up so New Orleans was kind of a very a big hub an international hub here there was a lot going on here I think it hit its peak here close to the same time in Paris in the late 1870s, 1880s was a, a high point for it. The same in, as in Paris after the Algerian War when it became the, as they say, the darling of the cafe society in Paris. So I think it coincided here because New Orleans with our French ties, you had people coming and going to Paris. People in New Orleans would send their children to be educated in France. So we were getting that give and take back from France with children going to school, parents going to visit relatives, relatives coming here. So we always have had that connection with France and what was going on in France was usually mirrored here in New Orleans. So you did have that same time frame, but the service here was different than in France. As the Opera House here in New Orleans was in the corner of Toulouse and Bourbon, and the building was a raised building. In other words, in the basement, there were commercial establishments. There were at least two large bar rooms or cafes, and then above was the Opera House itself. So people and the artists that were in the plays would congregate before and after the opera in these cafes. And Mr. Ferre was working at these in 1868, and he was serving absent there and he was known for that. Um, and he's kind of like, I guess you would say, one of the well-known people that was promoting it at the time. It seemed to be his specialty, so they say. So it was here since the 1830s, served various manners most probably. I do know that here in New Orleans, um, in the 1860s and 70s, it was served um, frappéed or with a drip, but it wasn't similar served in France, whereas in France, the bartender would um, give you your dose of absinthe and you would prepare it to your liking. You'd get a carafe and a spoon and you would fix it yourself. Here in New Orleans, it seemed like that the bartender prepared it for you. And in this case, Mr. Ferrier was the one that came up with this absinthe frappe using fountains to drip water over the sugar cube or into the glass to do the frappe. The old absinthe house as we know it was built in 1806 approximately by a gentleman named Francisco Uncadella. And he's listed here in New Orleans in um, notarial acts as early as 1803. And he formed, I know, of three partnerships. And the one in particular was in 1803 with a gentleman named Pedro Font, or Fon. And that was his business partner for these cabarets. When Mr. Uncadella dies, his wife leaves New Orleans with the two girl children and goes back to Spain and never comes back again. The property is then managed by his wife's nephews, which is the Alex's. They built this building and they built another one up on Conti and they were a commodity store warehouse. And this building is built in a very old Spanish style with an entresol. And what an entresol is, is you basically have your residence on the top floor, you have your warehouse in the middle, which is called the entresol, it's like a half a floor, and your business in the bottom. So you had a, like a complete unit all in one. You didn't have to have a separate warehouse. You had a little warehouse within your house and you lived there and your business was downstairs. 
When he opened this in, um, after 1806, it was, like I said, a commodities warehouse. The inventory in 1820 when he dies lists cigars, shirts, bottles, um, cutlery. So it was, it was a numerous things. The secret room is uh, rumored to have been the site where Andrew Jackson, Governor Claiborne, and Jean Lafitte planned the defense of the city of New Orleans. Um, the city and this area did not have a militia during that time, so uh, Andrew Jackson wanted help from the locals in defending this part of this, the country. Um, so what he did was gathered with uh, Jean Lafitte and uh, Governor Claiborne and got whomever he could to, that they could get to defend the city in the uh, Battle of New Orleans, which was in 1814. Jean Lafitte was a French pirate and privateer in the Gulf of Mexico. He operated a warehouse in New Orleans where he sold goods smuggled by his brother, Pierre Lafitte. Jean Lafitte tried to warn of a British attack. The American authorities invaded and captured most of Lafitte's fleet. It was in 1890 that the building was first listed as the old absinthe house. By 1868, one third of the vineyards in France were devastated. Uh, we know it was the wine producer who, who pushed to ban the absinthe because the wine was very hard to produce. 1868, the Philoxera outbreak um, virtually decimated the wine cognac areas of France. Wine cognac became either unavailable or much more expensive in cafes in Paris. From the 1850s until uh, the end of the 18th centuries, the absinthe will grow up, grow up uh, enormous. And uh, finally, uh, some jealousy will appear, appear by um, mainly wine producer, you know? So absinthe became very popular. Uh, unfortunately, when something becomes very popular, that can also be a problem. And there was more demand for absinthe and there was absinthe to go around. And that meant people started making their own absinthe at home. Now, Making absinthe at home, not necessarily a good thing. Making it in a French zinc bathtub, maybe definitely not a good thing. So you were getting some bad quality absinthe that were affecting the French market. Because the absinthe was so cheap, so uh, popular. The vineyards in France were replanted and they were able to start producing more high quality wine, more high quality cognac. And the wine companies started looking around saying, okay, where do we get our, our business back? You know, we've lost our business as a result of the phylloxera outbreak. We've replanted our vineyards. How do we get it back? Who should we get our business from? They decide to, to fight absent, to make an example. And they found in the wormwood herbs, in the oil of the wormwood herbs, they found a toxic uh, part, which is called it tuyon. This tuyon could be dangerous for your brain if you drink too much, but you should drink large, large amount of absinthe, maybe more than 400 liters per day. The temperance movement, which was kind of using Europe as a kind of dry run for the US a few years later, started looking at banning all spirits. How could they get into, I think there's heat into all spirits. And they were willing to work with the wine companies to kind of form a, a pincer movement uh, against absinthe. So you had a combination of the wine companies and the temperance movement wanting to get rid of absinthe. You had the fact there was bad absinthe around and that had caused problems. And there have been incidents as a result of that. Then in 1905, you had this incident of a Swiss farm laborer who drank in one day seven glasses of wine, six glasses of cognac, two creme de monts, two coffees laced with brandy, and finally two glasses of absinthe. Went home, shot his wife, children. Big incident, obviously. and. Uh, surprisingly, having drunk all of that wine, that cognac, creme de menthe, etc., it was not them that got the rap, it was absinthe that got the rap. So. And finally, wine producer, uh, medical people, uh, it was really a, an interest to, to, to kill the absinthe. It was maybe also the uh, anti-alcoholic group. 
but mainly people were back where wine and beer also maybe beer producer also tried to kill the absent which was so cheap and finally they, they push the authorities to kill this product in Switzerland it has been a little bit different because we we vote to ban the absent in 1908 it was popular votation and just two countries of Switzerland uh, decide to, to keep the absent. These two countries were Neuchâtel and Geneva uh, because these two countries were producers of absent and all other country, uh, country of Switzerland, German part, the Chinese, they decide to kill the absent. They decide because they fight the alcoholism and um, unfortunately for us uh, just before the, the, the vote, just before that uh, guy in a, in a, in a Vaux, in the county of Vaux, uh, killed his wife and children. And uh, they, they said this guy was drunk and this guy drunk, was drunk uh, uh, because absent. Good evening, husband. I'm hungry now. Your dinner is ready. I've been keeping it warm. Please sit. You know I like my food on the table when I get home. Good evening, Father. I'm waiting. Your father's been working a long day in the field. Let's just let him eat. I really wish you wouldn't put your boots on the table, Sean. Seems. If I leave them outside, you don't clean them. If I leave them by the front door, you don't clean them. Sean, you could just ask me. Just clean my boots. I wish you wouldn't go out tonight. Please tell me where you go at night. No! Why don't you go back inside and clean my boots? I want you to stay with me. The children, they're asleep. And Jackie. You clean my boots. I'll be home later. Fine. Just don't make it too late. You're nearly impossible to wake after you've been out drinking all night. That will be the day when I listen to you. Everybody drinks at night! I am not married to everyone. I am married to you, Jean. 
Then make sure my boots are clean. Hey! Make sure they're clean! Bartender. Bless you. <laughs> what is going on? anything I tell her to do. You work too hard. Teach her a lesson.
didn't clean my boots. I was gonna do it in the morning. Uh, what's the matter with you? Sure. I wanted them clean. By the time I got home! What is wrong with you? What, what do you have in your hand? What? August 28th, 1905, farm labourer living in Switzerland called Jean Lampre. Not living here, and living near Geneva. Who was actually French by birth. Well, that goes back to Switzerland, and that supposedly was the catalyst that got it banned in Switzerland, 1909, 1910. So he had what I guess was the ultimate cocktail one day. That this gentleman, um, I think he lived out on a farm, um, had gone out for the day and the story goes that he had been drinking wine two coffees laced with brandy two creme de menthe and then topped it off with some absinthe and came home and got in a fight with his wife because she didn't shine his boots or something and um he killed her and i think he killed the children obviously this was a pretty big incident they blamed it on absinthe and immediately some press, some uh, journalists uh, push uh, the story to say he, dr he was drunk with the absent. With the help of, I guess, the temperance movement, etc., uh, lobby groups got involved and they, one reason or another, they didn't want to buy in wine, seven glasses. They didn't want to ban cognac, six glasses. They didn't want to pick on creme de menthe, so they picked on absent. Forget that he had been drinking cognac and wine all day long but they blamed it on the absinthe. And that absinthe was the cool celebre, uh, and within a year there was a vote in Switzerland to get rid of absinthe, and four years later absinthe was banned in Switzerland altogether. It was a little bit just before the voting of, uh, of the, the ban of the absinthe. And they use it to, to improve the effect to, improve, to, to help people to vote to fight the absent. So to blame something like that just on the absent, you kind of have to look at the whole picture. This gentleman most probably had a lot more problems than just drinking a couple glasses of absinthe and going home and killing his wife. But it was a such a sensational trial in a, a murder that it kind of galvanized the people in Switzerland to think that absinthe needed to be banned. And that's what was one of the main causes of banning absinthe in Switzerland. But that was the, the big trial that um, led up to the banning of absinthe in Switzerland. It was a, a like an international thing. It was a big, big to do. Absinthe was described as hallucinogenic. They claimed that absinthe was worse than ordinary alcohol, experiencing crazy hallucinations. The temperance movement first began in 1789. Believe it or not, it was started in Connecticut. In the period after the American Revolutionary War, most Americans drank in excess. The temperance movement of the 19th and early 20th centuries were organized to encourage moderation. Beginning in the early 1800s, the movement tried to make people aware of their drinking. This was to get them to drink less. But by the 1820s, the movement started trying the total abstinence of alcohol. They urged people to stop drinking. In 1833, a more extreme form of temperance emerged called totalism. It originated in Preston, England. In 1847, the Band of Hope was formed in Leeds with a focus on the working class. And in 1864, the Salvation Army was formed in London with an emphasis on abstinence from alcohol and ministering to the working class. And again in 1898, James Cullen formed the Pioneer Total Abstinence Association. They had to do one thing, and when your competition is in the way, what do you have to do? Kill the competition. So the wine lobbyists got together with the temperance people, and they had to find the one thing in absinthe that said no other liquor, because you had gin, and you had or rum, and you had whiskey. 
But the only thing that's in absence that's in no other thing is Ormatesia absinthium, wormwood. So they had to find a way to vilify it. And the only thing they could do in that sense was point to the cheaper made absence that were being made with um, adulterated things. They were putting copper sulfate in it to make it turn greenish. And they were, they were doing things like that to, to make it look and act like the good Pernod, but it was a cheap knockoff brand. It was rock gut. And they latched on to that. They latched on to those types of liquors and said, in general, absinthe is bad for you. Absinthe will make you crazy. There was a famous saying on some cards was absinthe ran fou. Absinthe will make you crazy. It was a ticket to the crazy house. And the campaign was so strong in France, um, it's still to this day, people will say absinthe is not good for you. French psychiatrist Valentin Magnin studied many cases of alcoholism. He tested the effects of absinthe on a guinea pig which experienced convulsive seizures. The second guinea pig exposed to the other types of alcohol vapors did not. Magnon blamed the seizures on the wormwood. There was another similar murder in Geneva by a man named Salaz. After a drunken absinthe binge, he murdered his wife with a hatchet and a revolver. This is the Lafray case galvanized the public opinion in favor of the ban. Statue? Switzerland is made up of cantons, each are their own fully sovereign states. Baud was one of these cantons of southwestern Switzerland. The vineyards gave employment to many of the people from Baud. From 1839 to 1846, Baud was distracted by religious movements, attempting to turn the church into a simple department, free church. This canton's constitution dates back to late 1800s. Their government consisted of a grand council and a council of state. The council of state was made up of seven members that were selected by the grand council. On May 15th, 1906, the Bog Council of State voted to ban absinthe because of its high level of alcohol and constant campaigns from the temperance movement. On February 2nd, 1907, the grand council voted to ban the retail sale of absinthe and imitations in Switzerland. On July 5th, 1908, absinthe was officially banned in Switzerland. Article 32 of the Swiss Constitution was passed banning the manufacturing and possession of absinthe in Switzerland. Part of the myth of absinthe was the green fairy. We see that there were many manifestations of the fairies. The Green Fairy was good and inspired a lot of the artists of the 1800s. There was the Green Goddess who influenced men to inflict harmful pain on oneself for the love of others like Vincent van Gogh. And lastly, there is the Green Demon. The Green Demon, often mistaken for the Green Goddess, was responsible for the vicious crimes blamed on absinthe. Burn it! If you imagine government in Switzerland doesn't want to, to, to suppress this absence, but uh, the Alcoholism League makes this voting uh, necessary. We call that uh, initiative, initiative populaire. That means if you have enough people which request to, to kill something or to change a law, you need to, to vote. And uh, with that, this voting was almost ready to, 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 to take part. And finally, this stupid guy, Lofre, <laughs> killed uh, his wife and children. And finally, uh, people in Switzerland decided to stop the absence. It was in 1908. 
Into the box you go, Fairy. Why do I have to go in the box? Because of all the damage you've done to society. <laughs> I was just trying to have fun. There was a vote to ban absent in Switzerland. Happened in 1906. The ban, the vote, absent was eventually banned in Switzerland from 1910 onwards, in the USA from 1912 onwards, and in France from 1915. So absent was no longer made in its major production centres of Switzerland and France. Absent was no longer able to be drunk uh, in the USA, one of its major export markets. So absent was disappearing bit by bit all over the world. You're finished, Green Fairy. You'll be seeing me soon enough. <laughs> no one will ever be seeing you again. <laughs> <laughs>